Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Can we apply the principles of regenerative agriculture, diversity, we are part of nature, learning from nature with biomimicry and a focus on life, to technology? And what would this regenerative technology look like beyond food and agriculture? And can we apply these principles to more touchy subjects like cellular ag or plant-based proteins? Enjoy this interview where we dive deep into these topics. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode today with the founder and managing partner of Regen Ventures. Welcome, Dan. It's great to be with you, Khan. To start with a personal question, you have a very interesting background story, basically, and journey, but I would love to unpack that a bit. How did you end up focusing on regenerative technology, soil, food, and much more than that? Yeah, I guess I have a pretty non-linear background, started in investment banking and finance and derivatives trading, of all things, managed a hedge fund. Wow. And I guess I realized I was contributing very little positive to the world but understood the financial markets and wanted to utilize those skills in a more positive way. So started angel investing in some great companies in recycling and food waste, alternative proteins, joined a family office and was able to help them build out a strategy across their entire portfolio around impact. And then two years ago, began the journey of building Regen Ventures, which is a a global early stage venture capital firm that partners with founders daring to build companies that will restore our planet. And what makes, let's say, Regen Ventures different from, I mean, I see many funds popping up now, but you have a very specific focus. Why the word Regen in the in the name and, and not just <laughs> climate positive or positive this or net positive or climate tech or something like that? Because they also claim to want to restore the earth but you have very specifically chosen to put regeneration or regen in in the name. That's right. And really, you know, having learned the principles of regenerative agriculture, I set out to, you know, think about how they could be applied in other sectors. And the whole genesis of regen was around a realization that sustainability is not enough and that we needed to back companies that were working with nature instead of against nature and not only tackling emissions and climate impacts, but also planetary health, which for us encompasses biodiversity, you know, encourages the creation of life, water, nutrients, et cetera. And then thirdly, how human health interacts with those elements as well. And so that's, you know, core to our thesis is backing these companies that are going way beyond sustainability and directly improving the health of people and the planet. And when you say the principles of region ag, do you remember, let's say, when or how you stumbled upon that? Or maybe you grew up with that. What was the the start there when you look? I mean, I remember when I stumbled upon the soil farmers movement, but what was that in, in your case? I think I had a, like a general understanding, but Eric Tonsmeyer's book, The Carbon Farming Revolution, and then his profile in Drawdown were really kind of pivotal moments of not only seeing soil health and soil in general being this massive carbon sink, but all of the additional co-benefits from that around nutrient density, water retention, building communities together, and that you know it all started in the soil and the microbial activity and fungal networks within there as well. And so for me, that was kind of this 
going beyond sustainability and really thinking about whole system health and starting the ground beneath our feet was one of those pivotal moments for me and set off on a course of deep dives into all sorts of different things from there. But yeah, I would say those moments for me were pretty pivotal. And yet you decided to set up a venture fund that is not only focused on region ag and food. You didn't set up a farmland fund or you didn't set up an ag tech fund. You very specifically, and I will unpack that later, I'm very curious, said, let's apply these principles beyond agriculture and food as well. That's right. Why? Well, I had the benefit of setting up a couple of farmland funds and thoroughly enjoyed that and learned a huge amount. But I guess it, for me, it was we need to go way beyond that and that these principles of life creating investing were applicable across all systems and particularly where consumer demand can be part of the solution. And for us, you know, climate meeting that consumer appetite for greener, healthier, superior products is what can really scale solutions at a massive level. And that's where we're focused. And that means you're focusing on consumer facing brands or are you focusing specifically on, on those type of companies as investors or could it be one level away from the end consumer? Yeah, not necessarily consumer as in CPG, more so the things that touch our daily lives, what we eat, what we wear, the homes we live in, how we move around the planet and that these choices that we're making every day and these necessary products that are in our lives that can be produced in ways that are upstream healing the planet and downstream improving our health at the same time. So do you have any examples where you applied a whole system view, biomimicry approach to both the food space and the non-food space? And we can unpack a bit what you mean by regenerative technologies, which I'm very, very curious about, obviously. Sure. So why don't we start with a, a non-food space example, given I'm sure many of your listeners are very familiar with regenerative agriculture and the principles behind it. And so one of the companies that we're supporting are taking food waste and extracting collagen from that food waste to create leather alternatives. And so in doing so, really taking out of that supply chain the negative emissions impact of raising cattle for leather production, as well as the toxic chemicals and heavy metals utilized in the tanning process. And that for us was a shocking industry when we dug into it and we read reports that showed us 90% of people that worked in that industry died before the age of 50 years old in Bangladesh. And so if this company is taking the collagen source and then turning that into a beautiful material that is leather-like, finishing it with dyes and patterns in the production process, and then is then able to ship that to their end customers, which are beginning with the high-end fashion houses and then coming down the value chain and at scale can be cheaper than traditional leather alternatives. So for us, that's a, not only a circular, but also a regenerative materials company and then i think related to the food space you know we're really passionate about what would happen like the, you say they extract this collagen from the waste i mean what would have happened otherwise with that food waste and or is it still usable after do you only take one ingredient out like what is the alternative to making this alternative letter currently with this waste yeah it's generally ground down into animal feed or fertilizers and can still be done so so they're taking this rich collagen source out of that waste stream and then, I guess, upcycling that collagen into alternative leather materials. And the founder was doing his PhD at Cambridge and was studying cellular collagen cultivation. And in his mind, you know, worked out that that was going to take a lot of capital and be a long way from time to scale. So when scoured the natural world for rich collagen sources and then came across this extraction process to take it out of food waste. And is that process of looking for a chemical way and then finding out it potentially takes way longer and way more money and then going into nature between brackets, is that a, a normal process for like the founders you're backing? Does it seem to be something that happens often because you're really focusing on the biomimicry part? Or is it a one-off that somebody looked into cellular and then actually came across a, a more natural, I'm not, it's still food waste, but a more natural way to find this specific ingredient? Yeah, it's definitely a common thematic, both for us you know, as individuals and what we're looking for on the investment side and then the founders that we're meeting. And for us, we are nature obsessed. We say, you know, we're looking for companies that are nature derived, inspired by nature. And that sometimes is being part of nature and other times that is mimicking it, mimicking it. I don't even know if that's the word, right? 
through other means. So that's, you know, our passion is taking 4.6 billion years of evolution and taking all of that learning and applying our own human ingenuity on top of that to create products that are regenerative by nature. So how does cellular ag come into play when you are so nature focused? I think some people go like, how does that work? Or how do you see the role for that, sorry, in the future of food and ag? Yeah, so we may be unique in that we're really looking for regenerative whole systems change. And so thinking about food production, we are super passionate about regenerative agriculture and all of the positive co-benefits that can come from that, as well as there are, in our minds, places for plant-based alternatives, particularly when they're done with good core ingredients that are farmed in regenerative ways and where they're healthier for humans and they don't have a 300 list or 300 name list of ingredients on the label. And also cellular alternatives as well, where that is the most efficient, healthiest, sustainable approach. And then for us, it's thinking about what production methods can those alternative methods replace that then allow us to regenerate degraded grasslands, desertified grazing lands that haven't been farmed sustainably to date. So for us, we're taking like a whole system approach. We think all these things are necessary and we are engaged in all of them and we will, over the life of our fund, be investing across that continuum. And do you have examples of like the plant-based side, but also the cellular side? Because I'm very curious about it. You hear there's a lot of resources are going into that space. Mostly it sounds not very biomimicry to say the least, but I'm not an expert, but also the plant-based stuff, obviously like the 300 ingredients on a package is something we see very often or the 20 or 30, or whatever the number is. What do you see or what have you seen there that you can say, okay, this really fits in our thesis of putting nature, or we're a part of nature and putting nature first, but still use cellular agriculture or still use plant-based alternatives? Yeah. So for us, I think that the genetically modified monoculture, whether it's soy or pea protein based approaches are not regenerative. You know, the life cycle analysis might show that they're better than previous alternatives and that's okay, but for us, they're not truly regenerative. But there are all other alternatives, whether they're mycelium based. So Meaty is an amazing company based in Colorado that are using the structure of fungal networks through mycelium to create steak and chicken. And I tried it nearly two years ago now, and it was the most phenomenal not steak steak that I've ever eaten. So those types of approaches are, you know, fundamentally, that's a healthier product as well as being, in our minds, a regenerative practice or production method and using existing infrastructure. Because what does the mycelium grow on? What's like the feed source there? Because they also have to eat. So they're using yeast and microbes in, you know, essentially breweries, fermentation tanks, which again, like a natural process that is being accelerated within these factories, essentially to grow raw proteins. And that would be in the plant-based meat alternative space, basically. But it's not fair because it's not really a plant. Like mycelium is somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in another kingdom. Uh, but let's put them under the plant-based one. But then the cellular ones, have you seen things there that are... And cellular is, is just, can you explain the, the cellular agriculture concept and movement as well for people that are not comfortable with that? Sure. So cellular agriculture is taking a biopsy from a living animal and growing those cells in a lab in generally what's called a growth media to duplicate and proliferate those cells. So they generally start with muscle tissue. They proliferate the muscle cells then they add in things like fats to give you know structure and flavor. And then lastly, generally, there's a scaffold. So you can't just grow a bunch of cells in a flat Petri dish and expect it to come out looking like a steak. You've got to bind it together in certain ways. So that's generally the process. No animals are harmed in that process. Where does the fat, etc., come from? Is that vegetable fat at the end or animal fat? There's a, diff a set of different providers. Okay. So there are vegetable fats. There are companies using cellular animal fats, a company called Hoxton Farms in the UK. That's a great company. And also fermentation. So we've gone deep down the fermentation path, looking at a company that is building a fats platform using carbon dioxide as a feedstock. And then through that process, through fermentation, creating fats for initially cacao butter, so triglycerides. And then secondarily to that, you know, two of the same three triglycerides that are in chocolate are also in bacon fat. So that company 
building out the fats platform, which gives the flavor and the mouthfeel to these products that previously wasn't there and impossible when and did heme, which has been a controversial ingredient. Some people love it. Some people don't love it. But for us, this is a you know far more regenerative approach to doing so. Then you were asking about the cellular meat producers. And, you know, for us, one of the sort of most audacious, ambitious projects is an Australian company called Vow, which are the premise of that company is that we've only ever domesticated five species on earth for protein production, but there's 2 million species on earth. And if we don't need to harm those species, there's most likely a far healthier, delicious protein alternative out there for us to produce. And so they're building a cell library where they're taking cells from a wide range of exotic animals and they're proliferating those cells, growing those proteins. And essentially at the end of that, you'll be able to have 100% nutritional quality on one end and 100% taste and decadence potentially on the other and be able to combine those things to create different forms of food. So fundamentally redefining what meat is so that's quite interesting. We haven't invested in that company, but it's an incredibly ambitious project that we're really excited about. And what do you say to people that go immediately like, what about nutrients and health? Like, how would you define that in this case? And how do we know, how do we know it's safe? Or how do we know it's probably it easily wins against CAFO steak or, or anything coming out of a factory farm, but compared to let's say grass finished and finished beef. I mean, there's a lot of discussion on animal protein and the health benefits, depending on how you grow it. In this case, where would this fall? Or is this also the case of how you grow it makes the fundamental difference? Well, what is your response to people that go a bit like, should we do that? And what would be the reaction of, of my body basically to eating this, which nobody has done yet at scale, obviously? Yeah. And to be perfectly honest, I had the same reaction. Like, why do we need to do this? What are all the unintended consequences? And I think the honest answer is we don't yet know, but the bar is being set really high and the founders in generally in this space think the same as you and I, and they're wanting to optimize for both planetary health and human health and wanting to get to the best outcomes because they know that over time that's what the consumer will demand. So you know, those founders in particular are hyper-focused on that. They don't want this to be a, you know, a sort of slightly less bad for the planet but terrible for your health product. Those two things need to be inextricably linked and positive. And I think, you know, fully acknowledge the amazing interaction of soil microbiome with the gut microbiome and all of those things. So for example, like how do you I wouldn't say copy that, but how do you capture that in things like that? Is it like, okay, we're growing this lettuce in a in an aquaponics or an hydroponic system and, and it gets pretty good in terms of nutrients. But as John Kemp says, it never gets to the highest level because it, for that it would need soil. So we get pretty okay and probably better than many other things, but we get to level three and never, never to level five or something like that because for that it needs the soil. And that even assumes that we can measure that at the moment, which we can't really. So that's a, there's a huge discussion, obviously, what is nutrient density? So what's the bar here? We want to go to all the way to level five or level three is good enough? For us, level five, 100%. Like we want no compromise and that's a very high threshold. And that means that, you know, the universe of companies that meet that threshold for us is going to be pretty small. But that's not to say that the level threes are not necessary, but for us, we want these truly transformative catalytic system change companies that can redefine their categories and be regenerative for people and the planet and so that's how we think about it and you know i think you're right like and how long do you have like what's the fund lifetime because it cellular egg always sounds five to ten years away a bit like mini nuclear reactors which will come at some point but potentially but this might be a long journey what do you say to these founders? Like you're going to be there with them for a long time because they might take a while or you see that actually maybe happening faster than we expect. Like in five years, this could be actually a thing. Yeah, I think cellular ag is still quite a ways out and maybe that's beyond the lifetime of a venture fund. You know, we don't know the answer to that. And to be transparent, we haven't made any investments directly in that space. Because of that or because you didn't find it yet, the level five? Probably both. So he didn't find a level five yet that within the lifetime of a venture fund, there's a reasonable estimate that it, it might do, yeah, it might reach certain levels that make it relevant for the fund. Yeah. 
which is tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And so this company, Vow, probably is on its way to level five. And there are others trying. And, you know, we hope there are more. But again, you know, we are not attached to cellular agriculture. We fundamentally want to back companies that are regenerative across the whole system. And we think there's a role to play for all of them, as long as they are meeting the climate health, planetary health, and human health aspects of our, you know, the impact that we're looking for. And so how do you screen founders on that, I don't know, the biomimicry mindset? So to like, okay, because I see as a, quite a big separation in people in general that fundamentally see us as part of nature or fundamentally see us as, I don't know, the guardians or the stewards, and we can manipulate all the way through because we're not part of it anyway. How do you, is it like your first question you ask or how, how do you filter through that? <laughs> it's a good Especially question. Especially on Zoom because it, you were obviously far away. I mean, you're, you're able to travel now, but for the last year and a half, you were not. Like, how do you get comfortable with a, with a team if they are in the, the deep tech, we'll, we'll edit our way out of it or we're part of nature and maybe we should be a bit more humble? Yeah, so validating teams and human capital due diligence is a huge part of our process and we're investing early and oftentimes a company is an idea that has been validated at some tiny scale and has not yet proven itself to be viable at huge scale. But what we can test for, to your point, is the intent of the founders. And for us, that's everything. And, you know, is this their life's work? And are they building a company that aspires to these regenerative principles or are they aspiring to a cease to do harm, sustainability mindset. And again, like it's not a judgment of like what's better or worse, but for us, we're just shooting for that goal. And we think that venture capital exists to drive these fundamental breakthroughs. And for us, that's what we're looking for. So it's core. It's not a science. It's more of an art, I have to admit. But generally, we can feel it. And, you know, we want to go on that journey with people and we want them to be looking for us to support them and hold them accountable to that aspiration. And oftentimes we're self, you know, having founders self-select us, you know, they see Regen and the team that we've assembled and what our thesis and an aspiration is, and they're aligned to that and they want us to be supporting them for the whole journey. And so just to put a stake in the ground, we're now talking end of October, 2021. How many investments have you made? How much have you raised? What are the goals? for like the next months just to have to give people an idea of what what region venture is is at the moment which obviously changes almost every week but what are you uh, have you made two investments or 10 and what kind of assets under management currently yeah so we've closed on three investments with another two currently closing so we'll have a portfolio of five very soon and they range from the food and agriculture space to materials through to more data and measurement tools for soil organic carbon. We're a team of seven. We've got five on the investment team, two on the operational team, spread across Australia and North America. And then we've got an amazing advisory board supporting them. We've done a first close and we're heading towards our second close prior to Thanksgiving in the US. And yeah, we're on track. We're feeling great about things at the moment. And every one of our investors feels like an extension of the team and the partnership and they're coming along for the journey with us. And final close, what are you targeting in terms of size, just to give an idea of what we're talking about? Yeah, so 50 million US dollars and we're investing at seed stage generally. Occasionally we'll do pre-seed and series A. And do you find it, is it difficult to find deal flow in with very specific, but still a wide range of sectors, obviously, but a very specific thesis? How has been the deal flow journey? How has been the pipeline development? It's been prolific. It's super exciting. I think even in the last 12 to 18 months, things have changed dramatically. What we're really seeing now is the three pillars that our investment thesis was built upon, which was initially this convergence of science, technology, and engineering, making things possible that previously were not, and at price points that are cheaper than their extractive incumbents. Secondly, the sheer consumer demand for these products. So NYU, a woman named Tensi Whelan has a sustainable product index and sustainably branded products are growing seven times the growth rate of conventional and have a 40% price premium. So that kind of market pool 
is accelerating exponentially. And then the third piece, which is really around the talent and the people that want to go and build these companies and are leaving big tech, big corporate or, you know, universities where they might have a academic career to go and dedicate their lives to building companies that are healing the earth is exceptional. And so all of that combined is just sowing the seeds for a really rich environment for people to start companies. And then it's also a very collaborative ecosystem, you know, and I think that that's super important, whether it's accelerators, universities and other funds, like we need hundreds of trillions of dollars to flow into the space if we're going to solve these existential challenges. And nearly everyone in the market today who are backing these companies is looking to build great syndicates of investors to surround these founders with incredible support networks that can help them scale and scale quickly. And so for us, that's sort of the three areas that we're receiving inbound deal flow from. And, you know, we're reciprocating and it's a virtuous collective wisdom cycle. And is it getting, like, is the space heating up in a sense of valuations going up? Is there more competition? I mean, it's obviously the collaboration, but if you're, if a deal is limited in size, there might be some sharper elbows going around. Do you see any of that? Which it might be a good sign because it means we're getting more interest, but what do you see on that side? Or is it still, let's say, quote unquote, a bit lonely on the investor and the investor side? It's certainly heating up. Not only dedicated funds like ourselves, there's quite a few now that have launched in Europe, Pale Blue Dot, Friends in Sweden, we love, um, and 2150, which just launched more of a city infrastructure fund that's quite interesting. And then, you know, all around the world, there are very specific funds in certain categories. And then there are the generalists and the traditional tech funds that are allocating more and more capital to the space because underlying a lot of these companies is the core enabling technologies that have been developed over the last 10, 20, 30 years that's enabling a whole lot of these solutions and business models to be built on top of them. So, you know, we think the more capital, the better, better for founders. We're very comfortable with our role and our thesis and our ability to meet founders and demonstrate our support and value add over the journey. So so what do you miss? What is missing in this space at the moment? It sounds like there's a lot of deal flow and investors. What would you like to see more of? I would like to see more of these truly whole system regenerative companies, you know, like that where we're removing carbon, we're improving biodiversity, and through those things, the health of people is improving and that we can do that in business models that are scalable and do it fast. I think there are a lot of parts of that equation that can be met, but bringing all of those things together is no easy feat. And so which subsectors are you, would you love to see more deal flow? Is that the seaweed space? Is it the alternative, maybe the plant-based ones or the, um, I mean, you're laughing. You cannot see them. <laughs> we see it on video. Um, so, so definitely seaweed. We're going to dig a bit deeper, but is it the plant-based ones? Like apart from meaty, the mycelium space, is it, which other subsectors you say, okay, I would love, I would really love to see a thicker deal flow pipeline there. Yeah. We're doing a lot right now in biodiversity. So a whole piece of work on what is biodiversity? What are the problems with that market? Well, one, there isn't a market, you know, which is a problem. How do we value it? How do we measure it? Could be, maybe it's not a problem. I mean, how we value it and measure it, a measure for sure. But how we, I mean, there's obviously a camp that says if we put a price on it, it will be sold, but it will also be measured. So what's your take on biodiversity so far? It's early, but... It seems sort of the underlying, the underlying, val not value, the underlying theme in many of these things. Without biodiversity, most of this wouldn't exist. Most of us wouldn't exist. That's right. And so I think for us, getting away from this myopic focus just on carbon so that we don't go and plant millions and millions of eucalyptus trees in a monoculture environment that completely destroys any other life in that ecosystem. That we would be like, win on carbon, <laughs> but a total fail. It has such a positive carbon footprint. <laughs> Why is it not good then? Yeah. Exactly. And that's the problem, right? Because we're not valuing those other ecosystem services and all of the co-benefits that come from that. So, you know, I think that's an area that we have gone into with eyes wide open, with no kind of preconceived ideas of what the solution is. 
and starting to piece together what is required to, as you pointed out, measure. And unfortunately or fortunately, like we have a capitalistic model. If it is valued, it will be protected and improved upon, we hope. And so, you know, in the short term, that probably is the answer. Just like carbon, the economics of that now are starting to stack up so much that, you know, you mentioned seaweed, like where it's actually economical to grow gigatons of seaweed in the ocean and sink it to the bottom of the ocean for permanent storage. And that's a viable business model. There's a company doing that. I, I also saw a lot of discussion about if that actually made sense. But what is your take on that? Is that a holistic view, sinking it into the ocean? So basically for the listeners that don't know, there's a company backed by quite a few very famous investors that is growing seaweed and letting it float, basically sink down the bottom of the ocean where it should be stored for quite a while, basically sinking carbon into the depths of the ocean. And there's some discussion around the negative potential side effects of that. What would be your, I don't know if you invested in that, so maybe I'm on very thin ice We now, did not. But what is your holistic view on an approach like that? Not that specific company, because I think it's fascinating what they do, because it could be applied to seaweed growing and eating as well, because they just scale this tech with carbon credits, basically. But what is your thinking when you see something, when you see an article like that, or you see a deck like that? What's your thinking? Yeah, so for us, that particular solution is the highest quality carbon removal that you can get through nature-based solutions. So, you know, people want to build big machines and they want to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and they want to bury it underground. They are, and they're investing in it and it's a solution to everything then. Why, why not? <laughs> you know, and that's a thousands of dollars per ton and we don't know what happens when we squeeze it into these tiny cracks under the earth. You know, what could go wrong? Yeah, but they have Moore's Law. So like in, in a few years, it will be so much cheaper. I'm being sarcastic here, obviously. Yeah, totally. It, it might work. It might work. But there's a lot of brain power and resources going into that specific one instead of... It might work and it's likely to be necessary. Like, let's be realistic. Yeah. So, you know... But let's think about seaweed. So what excites you about that? Seaweed, on the other hand, has the same thousand-year permanent storage that direct air capture and storage does at a fraction of the cost and likely has a bunch of additional co-benefits around ecosystem restoration. We've destroyed 95% of the kelp forests on the planet so we can actively restore those. It's fish habitat. It cools sea surface temperatures as well as sinking carbon to the bottom of the ocean. So I think like net on net, of course, like too much of anything is a bad thing and we need to be careful of putting the right species in the right places and we were just talking about biodiversity, not having a monoculture of seaweed across the ocean that destroys everything that comes in its path. But I think like the right mindset and the right tools that are modular and scalable and not at risk of catastrophic failure, the first, you know, cyclone or hurricane that comes through. I think that those solutions, you know, have a place and, you know, we're excited. We're looking. And yet you didn't invest in this one. We didn't invest in that one. We looked at very hard at another one and continue to be really interested in the space. But what are you missing there? Is there like, yeah, you want to, do you want the seaweed to be useful in either for ingredients or cosmetics or feed or food? Does that fit better in your holistic thinking than sinking it, even though it's towards carbon? Yeah, I think it's a mix. But as you pointed out, seaweed has, you know, great use cases in cosmetics, in protein extraction for human consumption, in animal feed, in fertilizers, in plastics. So you know, I think that the value of seaweed can be great and also the carbon potential of it is quite extraordinary at a pretty low price point. So for us, that's you know what we're looking for and the teams that you know both have that ambition and the pragmatism to go build it. And I think like there's not a whole lot of IP in like putting some floating things in the ocean and growing stuff. So I think there's room for lots of people. It's very difficult. Eh? I have seen stuff. It's, yeah, it's very tricky. But then as a VC, you probably don't want, I'm just answering the question for you, but you probably don't want to invest in someone yeah, with not too much IP and a huge farming operation, because at the end of the day, it's a massive farming operation if you do this at scale. So where would you come in with, you're looking for that specific technology angle with unique IP, maybe on the extraction side or on the genetic side? Well, what would be a role theoretically for a VC like yourself in the seaweed space? Probably not at farming 100,000 hectares or something like that. Yeah, it's really around 
the structures and the devices to grow these on, you know, that are autonomous, solar powered. The tractors and the stuff. Yeah. You know, have self harvesting mechanisms built within them. The tools of the space, basically the tool shop of the, of exactly. the seaweed space is where, where you get excited. Yeah. That can enable massive industry. Super interesting. And then. So, okay, seaweed, we touched upon any other subsectors of the whole regeneration space, which is massive, but also in biodiversity, are you looking at marketplaces or sensors or what are you looking at or dreaming about that somebody knocks on your door tomorrow with the perfect team and the perfect nature focus and obviously the perfect values, but what would they need to be doing to get you excited in biodiversity? Yeah, I think measurement, reporting and verification for biodiversity is a really, really tough problem to solve it's much harder than carbon and even carbon is not that easy like it's no but we're talking like carbon is generally in a tree or below the ground whereas this you've got things flying around everywhere animals moving through an ecosystem like it's very dynamic do you think it would be possible to find like a proxy like i don't know wild bees or something that if you count that it's a pretty good proxy for the rest of the ecosystem or do we need a full system approach to say, okay, this place is full of biodiversity, which is a bit of a weird thing to say anyway, full of life, basically. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know something? I don't know about, you know, what the bees can tell us around measuring biodiversity, but yeah. They're good sensors. There's the good sensors. I think the wild ones. I mean, we had some interesting from a beekeeper, some interesting lessons and, and it seemed to be, obviously he was biased because it's a beekeeper, but then especially the wild ones have a very, good i mean if they're there it usually means the ecosystem is 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 on its way up or at least uh, in, in in a good shape if they're not there you can probably forget about it uh, but maybe there are other insect species or specific things that are easier to measure mm. but they give a good proxy for wild birds or certain predators if you have those obviously in context that like they always say if predators are around you you are i mean if they are happy the rest of the ecosystem must be happy as well because they can easily move normally or they die out but then are there markets around biodiversity yet, or is that still st completely starting? I think there are attempts to build them. But again, it's how do you place a value? Is it value per hectare? Is it value per ton or unit of biodiversity? I think all of these things yet to be determined, but incredibly interesting problems to tackle. And I think to your point around like actually the you know, measuring the species and the biodiversity within those, every system is so dynamic and different that a 10-star biodiversity near the equator may never be able to be replicated somewhere else. And so like the deserts, the grasslands, the scrublands, all these different areas I think will have, like carbon eventually will, a whole spectrum of biodiversity credits you know, the Great Barrier Reef's a great one here. Like we finally have reef credits in Australia around protecting harmful agricultural runoff from hitting the waterways that flow onto the reef. And so that's, you know, another example of us. Took 20 years, but finally, yeah. Um, that's yeah. <laughs> Go us. <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, it's, it's fundamental. At least at least something happened. I mean, that's that we can mourn on the, the losses, but at least something moved. Yeah. And, and hopefully it's an example for many other reefs that are in similar or even worse shape. Yeah. And so for, I think fundamentally too, shifting carbon and biodiversity from costs and expenses or quote unquote offsets to investments is a fundamental paradigm shift that we think will encourage the right behaviors and for the next generation to be investing in that future. Meaning let's invest in these farms upstream to change practices. So we actually protect them potentially regenerate plus seaweed investments part of the great barrier reef which will save half of our tourism industry because that is an investment to make sure that people can still go diving and not everything is bleached off basically then, then it becomes not a cost but it becomes a fundamental investment to save in this case the tourism industry and of course biodiversity and those making those connections with water sometimes the biodiversity might be easier than with carbon yeah and me as an individual if i choose to fly somewhere and i choose to offset those flights maybe I'm going to, you know, tick the box twice over and actually be investing and getting, being an owner of carbon rather than just offsetting my life. And so I'm actively being part of something that's building the solution as opposed to like just going to neutral. And so, yeah, I think there's a whole 
group of assets that are yet to be built, but are starting to be put together. And that's really exciting. And so if you had to give, obviously not investment advice, but like to, let's say there's a a whole audience, a theater full of impact investors or, or people looking for net positive impact, listening to this, what would you tell them to focus on or to look for? Would it be, I don't know, holistic view? Would it be look at seaweed? Would it be look at let some other sector or maybe somewhere else? Where should they start if they want to go down down the rabbit hole? If they're interested in regeneration in general, what would you give them as a as a pointer or as a map? Okay, start here and, and you can you can go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Look, I think everyone's different and we all have the things that we like to geek out on and are drawn to more specifically. But I think the beauty of this movement towards a regenerative economy is that the products and services that we depend on every single day can be part of the solution. So I think it starts with daily purchasing. And then from there, it's like, how do I then allocate capital towards things that I'm passionate about and people that I'm passionate about supporting and are going to fundamentally change the things that I want to be changed. And from there, I think like, as you know, for yourself with this podcast, like when you're excited and just intellectually curious about something, you do the work to go deeper and deeper and deeper to learn that system. So, you know, it's not for me to say what's important to other people, but I think what we eat and what we wear and how we move are like, you know, fundamentally core things that we should be investing in and that it's fun and the people doing that are the smartest, brightest, most ambitious people on the planet today and that these are going to be the companies that will be the iconic companies of the next 20, 30 years. And what do you say to, let's say it's a, we're, we're on stage in this theater, obviously a beautifully old one with a wooden floor. I'm just painting a picture for the audio. And and somebody asked you, but what about this technology is coming, the techno optimist, let's just use CRISPR, let's use gene editing, let's use vertical farming, because it's all possible. I, I've had those discussions very often. Like, what about that? What is your response to how do you get people? I'm, I'm looking for an answer personally, actually, it's a personal problem, I'm not asking for a friend, I'm asking for me. What is your way of making them, I don't know, curious about nature or a bit more humble, maybe in these because they've seen the decks of these techno optimist companies that promise the moon and the stars with 98% reductions in X, Y, Z, and usually turns out a bit different. But how do you get people slightly more curious about, I don't know, compost or a tree or another monoculture? Like, how do we get people to see nature, uh, to see us as part of nature? Is there a story you tell? Is there a book you recommend? Is there a trip you recommend? How do we, when we meet these extreme techno optimists, uh, how do we make them curious again? Or think beyond. Is there something you do? It's a great question. You know. <laughs> because you must meet them all, all the time. Yeah. I think just the acknowledgement that the Earth has been around for 4.6 billion years and what it has learned and evolved to, I just can't comprehend that we think, you know, our 1 million years on Earth is superior to that. So I think that's at a high level. But you asked about books, like I think Anna Ness. The Ecology of Wisdom is one of the most beautiful books that I've ever read and I think paints that picture beautifully and the humility that you pointed out that we are part of nature and that Earth will be fine. We might just get wiped out or we might wipe ourselves out, but Earth will be fine a million years from now. But like, why would we want that when we know that the solutions are right in front of us and that you know, we have the power to actually fundamentally change things and that we probably don't need to sacrifice anything to do that, that we can actually create a richer, more livable lifestyle for all of us by doing these things. To me, there's just like, it's so simple and clear and it's what I want to spend my life working on and my family is part of the journey and, you know, everyone we interact with, I think are aligned um, yeah, it's pretty simple to me. And if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing, like you say, we have the power to change. And let's say you have the magic power to change one thing overnight in food and ag, but could be apparel, could be global consciousness, could be abolishing chemical pesticides. I mean, it could be anything or making us all taste better food overnight and, and healing our taste buds. I mean, what would you do? That's a good question. I would just encourage people to go outside 
go for a hike and come back and just acknowledge the feelings that you had being in the wild and all of the life that was around you and come back into human world and figure out like is that worth sacrificing for that extra bedroom or faster petrol powered car like really i think that's as simple as it is for me like love nature and all of the creatures and do our best to support that and have fun doing it so there is a bit of i wouldn't say a sacrifice but if i really want my faster petrol car there's there's behavioral change necessary it's not that we can just keep going because I might want an extra bedroom or I think I want it or I need it. What do you see as the role of behavior change in this whole space? Because we might end up buying a different steak because it's mycelium based or a different apparel because it's no longer leather, but equally or better. But they, so there, there are choices we have to make or we should make. And it seems like people are making that. That's what you refer to as consumer demand is going to be tricky to get everybody on board with that with those choices or do we need a, a stubborn 20 or 15 percent to kick this off how do you see that and then it just becomes obvious like it seems to be a bit with electric cars at the moment even though there's still a lot of denial and reports coming out that actually it's not as clean obviously usually sponsored by the fossil fuel companies like there's still a lot of like noise on the radar it seems but do you see that happening as well in our space or are we still too early for that yeah i just think you know, products that are, we call it the daft punk thesis, you know, better, faster, stronger, cheaper, um, cooler, whatever it might be. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like there's going to be demand for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, out of the gate, they may be more expensive, but the cost curves are coming down so quickly that I don't think people are going to need to pay more for some of these things in the future if we incentivize things right. And, you know, your question will point around nutrient density before, like, if we know the true cost of things, like I think we know the right choices to make and that they're just going to be better and make our lives better. And, you know, I don't think we're going to get there with the urgency we need to by sort of depending on altruistic motivations or human consciousness. Like as much as we do need to change that, it's probably, you know, not in our lifetime to do that. So I think for us, it's... You can invest in a lot of uh, meditation apps that might help, actually. <laughs> it might be on consciousness level, that might be the best investment you can you can make, I sometimes think. Totally. But like the, the head spaces and car... Or raising and, yeah. children, you know. Yeah, or being a good parent. And so what if like overnight, we, we took your magic wand away, unfortunately, but your fund did grow to $1 billion. And what would you focus on? I'm not asking specific dollar amounts, et cetera, but what would be instead of 50 million, you actually had a billion dollars to invest. Would you be exactly focusing on the same thing and just scale the team, basically 20 X, or would you do certain things differently? Would you do a farmland fund on the side to do a lot of things or a rewilding fund or a biodiversity fund? Or how would you approach it if you had a significantly more resources on the financial side than you have now? Yeah, so our vision from the get-go is to build a global platform, not only a single fund. And so you know, that is our roadmap, exactly what you said. And creating a regenerative capital stack across the entire life cycle of a company from the first check-in to IPO. And then on top of that infrastructure, you know, farmland, real assets, credit in time, and that those assets are have the right capital base in order to achieve the outcomes and impacts that we need them to. That's our vision. And that's what I'd be doing with that. And I'm, I'm probably going to open a rabbit hole here. What about, you mentioned IPO, what about ownership? What about long-term ownership? Everybody knows the, the challenges and opportunities of the stock market. What do you feel there for these regenerative companies? Do, does there need to be a different regenerative ownership structure? But what are your thoughts there? I mean, many of the companies you talk with, are still a few years away, let's say, from IPO. So you have you have the chance to figure that out. Yeah. But what does a regenerative ownership structure look like or should they all go to the, the general stock exchange? Yeah, I think there's more long-term holding structures than there ever has been. Whether that's private markets model or a public markets model, I'm not tired either way. That's probably changed over the last 12 to 18 months. But fundamentally, you see companies like Rivian going public now and Rose, who's one of our partners, is a board member there. And they just made nature a shareholder. 
they gave 1% of the equity of the company to nature to conserve. Just for a background, Rose is the ex-CEO of Patagonia, just to but people that don't know. And Rivian is an electric car company that makes very interesting, very big pickup trucks, basically predominantly for the US market at the moment, but they look quite cool. I'll put a link in the in the description if that's your kind of thing. But they make nature. I didn't know that. They made nature their shareholder. That's interesting. And how does she vote? Probably quite radical. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Um, I guess, but that's an example, I think, of embedding these values, not only in private markets, but in public markets. And then you have things like the long-term stock exchange, you know, now cropping up where Asana and there's another company that have now listed their stock there. And then you have Carta, which is an amazing fund administrator and share registry platform creating liquidity within companies on a, a thing called Carter X, you know, an internal exchange where I'm a private company like Stripe and I'm actually able to trade shares amongst my employees, my shareholders through this exchange. So like, I think there are... So it's private, but sort of public for a limited public. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of... And in a few years when you have to deal with these things, probably the amount of options, the number of options will have exploded again, basically, because these two options weren't there two years ago. Yeah. And I think it's important that we, the day we're talking today, Sequoia just announced an evergreen fund. And wow. So that, yeah. That's interesting. You know, they're innovating on the venture capital model. And was that your dream to do an evergreen fund? It was. <laughs> another, yeah. another rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> we need other, <laughs> we need other episodes for this, but that's interesting because I've talked to many and they say, okay, we, we could have done an evergreen, probably raised less, probably spent a lot more time trying to convince people. And, and yeah, we're running out of time on the climate side and biodiversity side. So it's a trade off to invest now and then figure out along the way what the next phase for these companies look like. And yeah, it's, it's a shame that not more uh, investors are ready, but the fact that Sequoia is doing an evergreen probably makes the next one a bit easier if you also do an evergreen That's in right. the future. Yeah. Yeah. Look, they did it. <laughs> You're not, not, not the only weirdo in the corner anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. And it's, you know, it doesn't work for everyone, but I think. You know, no, but uh, there's more options on the table. Exactly. You know, the right option for the right company, the right form of capital, the right, time. the right time. I think, you know, they're all there. Which is, I mean, sort of the core thesis. I mean, you need diversity in regeneration, which is a core theme within. You need diversity in, in terms of capital options. And so far it has been either debt or equity and not so many flavors in between. And that's changing fast, it seems, uh, which is which is good. I want to thank you so much. We have a lot more to discuss, but it's probably not the last time we chat. Thank you for sharing. I'm very curious to follow Regen Ventures over time to see what investments you make, to see what you learn about biodiversity and, and what you end up investing in, because it's always an interesting, it's, it's interesting to do the research and then how does it actually get practical, how and if and when you invest in cellular ag, cellular ag obviously, and also seaweed and, and many other things. So thank you so much. This evening for you then for sharing a bit with us on the podcast thank you so much for having me cohen and you know for all you've done over i believe five years now with the podcast i think it's been you know a core part of the regenerative agriculture movement and i've learned a lot from all your amazing guests it's been awesome to be on thanks thank you so much if you found the investing in regenerative agriculture and food podcast valuable there are a few simple ways you can use to support it number one rate and review the podcast on your podcast app that's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? 
and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.